It's been um, interesting, to say the least, uh, for myself and I think for others that have been attending throughout the last two days um, as um, uh, an emerging scholar of Aboriginal literature, of course, it's so wonderful to have so many amazing writers here, to hear them speak their work. Um, but what has also been uh, so meaningful to me is the realization that not only are these people our creative minds um, in our community, they are also our teachers. Um, and they, they come with a lot of wisdom about our communities that they share through their work. Um, I was uh, an undergraduate student in, um, in 1993, University of Saskatchewan, um, and I, I was in my fourth year, and up to that point, um, I'd survived the academic experience by blending in, um, by avoiding conflict, um, by keeping my head down, and by settling for the dominance of Euro-Canadian literature in, uh, where, in my program. Uh, Lee Maracle's work, I Am Woman, changed that for me, and there was no going back. <laughs> Thank you for that. Lee Maracle is a member of the Stolo Nation, um, and she's an award-winning writer and teacher. She is one of the founders of the Analkin International School of Writing in Penticton, BC, the author of a number of works of fiction, including Sojourners and Sundogs, Raven Song, and I Am Woman. She's also the co-editor of a number of anthologies, including the award-winning publication, My Home As I Remember, and co-author of Telling It, Women and Language Across Culture. Lee Maracle received the J.T. Stewart Voices of Change Award in April 2000. And please join me in welcoming Lee Maracle. from the West Coast, you know, and I was the tallest person on my reserve for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Including many of my brothers, my father, and my uncles. I'm going to read a little bit uh, from Will's Garden, but first I want to read a little poem for Lewis Owens, who wrote Bone Gang, and I loved him for that. And then uh, we were corresponding with each other, which writers do often before they meet. And uh, he was going to come to Bellingham, where I was the distinguished visiting scholar for Canadian culture. And uh, I was sitting in the classroom waiting and waiting. And he was at the airport in his home shooting himself. And uh, this came out as I sat there thinking about it after the class. I actually did the class for him. I don't know how I managed to get through that. Uh, but we never actually met. Just a lot of words. My imagination wanders inside this thin ribbon of time. Sandwiched between stone and light, it captures only glimpses of shapes from the shadows of former and future being. My origin, cast by stone, weighs upon my spirit. The future, memoried in fanciful moments of desire, dances weightless and unrealized. The present is a colorful, painfully slim ribbon of opportunity measured in seconds, minutes, and hours that is constantly sliding away. I land on this ribbon as it swings freely in space. I plan from it, dangle dangerously, hoping I can make my plans real, tangible, and tactile, that from them I can glean some satisfied sense of being. Yesterday, Lewis Owens shared this same ribbon of time. Born in July, just two years ahead of me, I wondered whether his birth was too was signaled by lightning and hail, but knew it didn't matter. We sung, swung through the same space, floating from one story to the next, garnered little moments of love where we could, stolen between hours of fulfilling our story duty, until let Lewis let go. I watched him free fall into space, listened to his characters perish as he ended their journey too. Pages floated above his falling life. Pages of new beginnings dying to become characters in some old story, 
yet to be written, call out to me. I wanted to let go of my ribbon and rush to save them. While they fell, I wondered what kept my hands glued to it. What imagined sense of self wandered through my body, fired the grip on my fingers, and made them hold this fragile slip of tight space? Is it the stones of origin weighting my being to this quarrel with future that keeps me clutching this ribbon of time? And that written this, but I can't uh, read it very well. I'll try now. Or is it my myriad of characters waiting to be storied up that keep me stuck to seeing it through no matter what? Even more significantly, I wonder what demon struck Lewis's imagination and bade him let go. Richard's always telling people what a wonderful book it is. And, um, well, Richard only likes the books I write about where the characters are boys, by the way. I don't know what that's about, but he's dead name. That's all I can say. But I want to read you this little bit. He's uh, going through his Becoming Man ceremony, and you know how we are. We wait till it's a crisis, and then we get started on it because we can all handle crisis. So they're late. <laughs> and uh, he's about to meet is Auntie Anne's friend's daughter. He's 16. She's 15. He hasn't seen her yet, but she knows his cousin, Wit. And Wit is a beautiful, two-spirited boy, a downriver stallow. Who's Wit? Anne asks, looking at my mom as though I just left. Isn't Wit that white boy? She asks me, ignoring Anne. Well, Lonnie says her grandma married white, and so did, did one of the sisters, Anne says. Again, like I'm not there. I think the one that lives out here did marry out. She's talking to herself now, my mom. I don't want to confuse the air in the room, so I, I leave. Who's wit? Auntie Anne insists on knowing. I can hear my mom telling her about my new friend, wit as I saunter down the hall and try to picture his cousin. I'm catching on to the call. Wit's pretty looking. He reminds me of a pale-skinned Hawaiian poster girl, almost. I go back down the hall to the kitchen. I have to ask, how old is his daughter? Don't you even go there, boy, my mom says. You're not a man yet. You won't be after this ceremony either. You have four more years and a winter dance to go through before you even think about that. Fifteen, Auntie Anne says, with a wink. Hush you! Don't you get him started, my mom scolds. Ooh, he must have his daddy's blood. Auntie Anne giggles. My mom can't help laughing, too. As I walk back toward the living room, I wonder how they're going to get here. There is no bus service to this reserve nor any other reserve I know of either. Well, except North Van Squamish Band. Maybe they don't know that. I go back to the kitchen. Don't you have some work to do, my mom says. How are they going to get here, I ask. Oh, isn't that sweet? He's worried about them. And gives mama a nudge. You're so dead, Anne, you're so dead. If you just don't let up, mom scolds. Car, honey. They're coming by car, Anne assures me, and pays no attention to her elder sister's threat. Around 10 o'clock, about the time I finish Aunt Bessie's garden, these beating gardens of flowers, I hear a car. My heart stops. What if she's beautiful? What if she's light like wit? I don't want some lights getting native. I want one lights that song, Pretty Brown. I wonder about courtship. I stab myself a good one with a needle. He's beating. Sarah gives me a what's up with that kind of look. Anne enters, enters the living room, looking triumphant. There's no imagination that can conjure a woman as beautiful as her friend. She has a brilliant drop-dead beautiful smile. She's slender and moves like she's walking on water. She looks to be about 35 years old, but has the kind of face you know is going to be gorgeous forever. She's the most beautiful woman in the world. Ooh, then her daughter slides in behind her. 
My eyes hurt. Something else is beginning to ache, too. Some piece of me that until now had been only functional. Even an occasional pain in the butt had just woke up. I lay the cape on my lap. Both my brothers, older brothers, laugh. They know what's going on. I want to die. I have to look again. I look up, grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> That's what our guys do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're famous for it. <laughs> well, why don't you show Lonnie and her daughter to the room, my aunt says. <laughs> she borders on cruel. As I stand up to show them upstairs, I step on the thread to my own needle. It stopped my feet, but my upper body kept going. I land nearly in the laps of the two women. They step back and catch me, then smile politely, like this must be a traditional stall of welcome. <laughs> We're so honored to be here, slides out of Lottie's lips, sultry and lyrical. Sorry, I managed to mumble while I dropped the cape. That's a stall of boy's way of saying we're honored to have you. My older brother George says, and he and Tony laugh. Bastards, her daughter winks. I don't know her name. I lead them to the st stairs. I can't believe what a goof I've just become. I stop halfway up to see if they're still coming, and of course they are, so Lonnie bumps into me. I say sorry. Then like seven different kinds of a fool, I do it again. We will follow you, Will. Just lead the way. She's so polite. She doesn't want to say straighten up, boy. She has the politeness of a woman who knows the effect she has on a man. She also knows her daughter has the same magic. If it's possible, she's a younger, prettier version of her mom. She isn't light, though, so Lani must have married another Indian. Ooh, that makes her too much. I can't stop grinning. I managed to make it through two flights of stairs. At the door, I pause again. They bump into me. I apologize. I can't for the life of me think of a reason not to let them in. But I do not want to open that door. I have to open that door. Is there something wrong, Will? Wandy purse. No. I open the door casually, but quickly I explain that they can use the bottom drawer for their personal things. I tell them the window is old and show them how it works, where to find the stick to hold it up. If they want it open, I point out the alarm clock and show them how to set it. Finally, I say the clean sheets are on the night table, but they could see that. I turn to leave, hoping neither of them looks at the wall. That way I won't have to apologize for the wall posters. I could shoot myself for having such bad taste. <sighs> Once some guys made an Indian calendar, you know, for boys. Every Indian nation's woman got on their case about this particular year. So they toned the next ones down after that. The gals are dressed skimpy and wearing inviting looks on their faces. March is still up and it's early June. Not that it matters since the year's wrong too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> of all the women, March is the least dressed. <laughs> I want to change it, but it would be so tacky. I want to tear it off the wall, but that means I'd have to face my guilt and embarrassment. I'm almost out the door when I hear it. Oh, she's very pretty, the young one says, and gives me a naughty, naughty, finger-wagging kind of look. March, isn't it June? <laughs> oh, well, it's also the year 2000, and the calendar says 96. Doesn't it, Will? Her mother asks. I take it off the wall and say I'm sorry. Oh, you can leave it up if you like, just in case we get confused about what day it's not. <laughs> Thank you. 
table that, uh, that features all of the books of, uh, of our writers here and also others. And Louise is one. Actually, I want to thank you. You put a lot of energy in, mm -hmm. you know, with Robert. And so I thank you for having us here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and good night.